if you'll please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful to be able to come together in this hour to be able to study your word, to be able to look upon the actions that we need to take in our own lives. And we pray, dear God, that as we study, uh, study this hour, that we'll be self-reflective, but also self-corrective of the things that we see that we need to have corrected in our lives. We know, dear God, that you are a compassionate God, one that is full of mercy. We also know, dear God, that we are um, so easily entangled in sin, but we know that that mercy can overcome our sin if we repent of those things. We know that you are just as quick to forgive as we are to repent. So we pray that we'll learn the humbleness of mind to be able to come to our senses, put those things away, repent from those things, and fill them with uh, righteous things. We pray to God now as we continue to study in your word that we'll see ourselves in it, that we'll learn and be able to teach others. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Help us to learn to be the type of people that you would have us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, if you will turn to the book of John, and I'm just going to just tonight, you know, I'm just going to kind of go over an overview. We may get some, some of John 1 also. Because I want to tell you, John chapter 1 and verse 1, very simple words, but very deep. And so there's a lot in John. First and foremost, uh, does anybody know why John was even written? Just to kind of fill in some gaps, maybe he saw that, well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't do too good of a job, so I'm going to fill in the gaps here. Or does he give a reason? You will turn to John chapter 20. He gives the exact reason that he wrote the book. Chapter 20 and verse 30. And it seems as if he kind of makes this, you know, because we, you, if you, once we kind of get into the book of John, uh, chapter 20, we see that it was the resurrection. And he's talking about the resurrection. And he's presents himself to the disciples, and then just kind of out of the blue, he kind of says this, uh, John chapter 20 and verse 30. Uh, Rick, if you will, please read that for us. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. All right, and then he stops there and says, well, after these things, Jesus, you know, and then we go right back to the story. So it seems kind of abrupt, but as we kind of move through John chapter 20, I think there's a reason that he puts that there, and we'll talk about that reason uh, in the future. However, I want to kind of um, note that John was written for a very specific reason, and he says, these signs and these wonders that I'm writing about, I'm writing so that you may believe. And that in believing, you can have everlasting life. So, he doesn't say anything about the other Gospels, that they, are, they don't do injustice or anything like that. What he's saying is that I've experienced this, and we'll start, we'll start to kind of read that in John chapter 1 also, and I want to talk to you about my experience. And, we talk, and he talks more about the teachings of Jesus in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and uh, specifically more in 1st John. But however, we uh, associate uh, this book with the book of belief. And that is that it is a book that was written so that you might believe. Um, as we kind of look, I want to kind of go over, first of all, the, the breakdown of the chapters and stuff like that. But does anybody know what the theme of the book is other than these signs that were written? Does anybody know what the theme is? And you'll see that if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then you read John, it is a completely different written, the way that he writes it is completely different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it is written at a very emotional level and a very personal level as well. So does anybody know kind of what the, what the theme is? What is he trying to point out in Jesus? Go ahead. I've seen people show that John points to more of Jesus' deity. Correct. 
Yeah, what he's trying to do is that he's got some fun. So what he's trying to do in John is he is trying to take the life of all that. Oh, that's embarrassing. It's okay, JJ. Um, but what he does in John is he's trying to prove that God has come in the flesh. And this man Jesus is the is the Christ, the one that has been spoken of of old time. He also says, you know, we you know we would have a lot of questions, I guess, if we were looking for God in the flesh. You know, God in the flesh, what would He be like? Um, you know, how how would He live in a relationship with mankind and a relationship with His own Father? Um, how would people know He was God? I mean, can someone just come up and say, "I'm the Son of Man"? Does it really matter? You know, so. John uh, writes about that. You know, how how would people believe in him? Would he force them to believe? What about you know those who refused to believe he was God? What would happen with them? Uh, another question I kind of came up with that I thought you know maybe I would kind of question if I were looking for God in the flesh. What about those who believed and those who followed him? What would become of them? What's the What's the payoff, so to speak? Why should I follow Him? Even with all of these miracles and signs and all that, why should I follow Him? And what would God in the flesh expect out of me being a believer? John answers all of those questions. And John also answers those questions in a way that we can understand because it's not a hard book to read. Uh, it's a very easy book to read. It is very simple, but again, it is not uh, a, just a surface book. It is a very deep book. There's a lot in here. So as we kind of move through, I want you to kind of keep that in mind, what we're trying to do with John, and that is he's trying to prove that God has come in the flesh. All right. Any comments or any uh, anybody else getting anything different or um, want to add to that? All right. John is very unique in the fact that it does have a lot of uh, things that the other Gospels do not. Um, again, I think that John is kind of looking back at those other Gospels, and he probably uh, is trying to fill in some of the holes maybe that they have, um, or he's um, maybe looking at it and going, okay, I'm going to tell my personal, what I personally saw. Um, if you ever look at the harmony of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are usually called the synoptic Gospels because they are very synonymous with one another. However, John has a lot of uh, different stuff in it that the other Gospels do not. And a lot of these things we would never know about um, the story of Christ had John not written this book. Um, one of the things that kind of, uh, that, that kind of um, surprised me was these miracles, a lot of them are not mentioned in any of the other Gospels. First, The very first one, everybody know what the first one was? The water and the wine. John is the only one that talks about that. And um, we also see that his first miracle um, with water and the wine was there. The first cleansing at the temple um, is only mentioned in John. Nicodemus kind of visiting with Jesus and how he got to know Jesus uh, is only mentioned in John. Um, and we also see John the Baptist whenever he says that famous line, I must decrease but he must increase. Only mentioned in John. Go ahead. John also has the distinction of being there from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, Luke, we know, was one of Paul's traveling companions. He was, his book, both Luke and Acts, were both targeted to a, towards a single individual or the people around him. Um, so he was not here. Matthew, we know, comes in later. Right, so he's the John's the only one that was there at the beginning. Well, and and I feel that's going to change a little bit of how we see it. Yeah, you know, and the, and the thing is, some of these things you can kind of see that, and when John's trying to point these things out, he's very specific in why he's putting in things that he does, and. John's book, specifically whenever, and I, we'll talk about the breakdown here in a second, but chapters 1 through 12, you don't hear a lot about the, the apostles. I mean, other than how they touch Christ in the fact of trying to prove through those miracles that he is, um, 
the, the Messiah, we don't know a lot about them. We wouldn't know a whole lot about them if we just relied just on his um, story. We wouldn't know a whole lot about the, the apostles. Um, so, but yeah, you're right. I mean, he was there from the beginning, and we also know he was the last one left, too. So, he's got a lot to say, a lot of wisdom. And you can tell also, when you have a man who Jesus calls the Son of Thunder, and then he writes a book like John, and then he writes a book like 1 John, you can tell there has been a huge change in him. And I think that's why he also writes this book as well, to show that, um, that you can change. You, know, you don't have to be who you are. You can be a new creature. Um, um, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well, uh, she's only mentioned in John. Um, the child who is healed at uh, Capernaum, um, only mentioned in John. The lame man uh, who was healed in Jerusalem on the Sabbath, only mentioned in John. Um, some of the attempts to kill Jesus are only mentioned in there. Whenever Jesus teaches that he is equal with the Father, that is only mentioned in John. Um, and then, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a whole other, you know, a lot more we could kind of continue to go into. I don't want to get too wrapped up in it. But just some of those things, like the, the man who was born blind, and how wonderful that was, you'd think that all of them would share it. It's only John that you find that, and that's in John chapter 9. Uh, John chapter 10 um, whenever we see that Christ says, I am the good shepherd, um, and we know that story, you only find that in John. So you can see this very personal thing that John is probably looking at the other Gospels and saying, you know, let me talk more about Jesus and his teachings. And um, what we see uh, first and foremost in John is trying to prove through those miracles that Jesus is the Christ, and then later on we start hearing more of the teaching that uh, Jesus does, but that's not his main focus. Um, I am the vine and you are the branches. John chapter 15, only found in John. And then um, we talk about also whenever uh, he's uh, praying for them. Again, in John chapter 17, that's the only time that we see that prayer mentioned also. Uh, so there's a lot in John that you learn if you uh, only have read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, also kind of you know, when you look at Luke specifically, why did Luke write what he did? Anybody remember? It was to what appears to be a Roman official. Yeah, so why, why did he write it, though? He wrote it chronologically to, yeah, I'm going to give you everything that kind of happened from what I can kind of gather and all that kind of stuff. And I won't say John took issue with it, but John makes this mention. At the very last, in John chapter 21, he says, in verse 25, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So, maybe you disagree with there with Luke, I don't know. But you know, we know that Luke is, um, writes what he does to chronologically give you something that you can see how Jesus' lives unfold. Whenever we talk about the signs and the wonders and all of those great things that Christ did to prove that He was the Christ, the world could not contain the scrolls that would, that would be needed in order to make you know, a detailed um, summary of those things. So what John is telling us is, look, what John is telling us is, look, we are not, um, I am not going to tell you that this is all there is to it. But what I am saying is, I wrote this for a very specific purpose. Go ahead, Steve. Well, Luke writes it, he says, to know the certainty right. of the things in which you've been instructed. He's not claiming to write an exhaustive right. thing of, of the life of Christ. Like each of the Gospels, they, they do a, I don't know if you would say thorough summary, but they each, each of them covers uh, certain aspects of life of Christ mm -hmm. and John acknowledges look it's there's no way to cover everything right. that he did and that's part of what you see between the gospel accounts is there are those gaps that some of them pick up that the others don't and John's pointing us to but there's still a whole lot more that 
really not only John hasn't covered, but the others didn't cover, that the Lord just left off. Right. That we have what we need now. Right. And I think, you know, that's kind of what John was kind of wrapping things up with, is that, um, you know, because John's gospel comes much later after the others. And so, you know, whenever he writes his, he's writing his probably in because there's a lot of Gnosticism and, you know, a lot of trying to debunk about who Christ was and stuff like that because, of course, it's long after his resurrection. So I think that's the reason that he felt it necessary that I'm going to write a gospel so that you can believe that Jesus was the Christ. You know, and if you read in John chapter 21, previous to that verse 25 and 24, he says, this disciple who is the testifying, I'm testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. So we know uh, what's going on, um, you know, that all of this has been seen, has been documented, it's recorded for us, for you, today, 2,000 years into the future, which is mind-boggling to me, and it's still so pertinent to what we have, or what we need. All right, let's turn on back. All right, so chapters 1 through 12, as, as I made mention, um, it's, if it were a, if that were the book, if that were the end of the book, and that is 1 through 12, it would be a book of signs. There are seven signs that are kind of mentioned if you um, look at 1 through 12. And as we mentioned before, water and the wine was the first one. Um, anybody know what the second one is? I'll try to guess. See how many we can guess before we get into it. Of the son. Yeah, you got the hero of the royal official's son. Um, and then uh, the third one is he heals the paralytic. The fourth one, which is mentioned in just about all of them, that is feeding of the 5,000. The fifth one, he walks on water. The sixth one, he heals a blind man. And then seven, anybody know what the seventh one is? Lazarus. It's mm -hmm. the raising of Lazarus. And so um, through all of that, that should lead somebody to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And again, this was done in crowds. This was not done in some secret corner somewhere. This was done in front of people. John is simply recording these things. He's recording also the fact that he can testify to them, that there were others who testified to them. Uh, some of the other apostles uh, have their writings as well, and they can testify to those things that they saw uh, but what we find, uh, again, is he chose these seven for a very specific purpose, and, so, and that is so that you might believe. And you're going to hear that word a lot in John, is the word believe. Um, if you have done any kind of, if you've kind of read through it, you, you'll read the word believe a lot, you'll read the word life a lot. Uh, the other ones that I read that kind of stood, stood out to me was uh, love, sin, true or truth, and then also uh, the Spirit is mentioned quite often also in it. Um, we also see that those key words, if you kind of mark through them and just kind of, you know, or highlight them and stuff like that, your Bible's going to be highlighted just about all the way through John because it talks so much about those uh, key words, and that's just 1 through 12. Um, Whenever we're talking about these portrayals of, of Christ also, because, and that's what, um, again, he's trying to point to uh, some of these things, the portrayals of, portrayals of Jesus is how he's pictured or how he described. And you'll see this quite often also. For example, the Word, the Lamb of God, um, you know, things like that. You'll see uh, through here the light of the world. Um, we'll, see, we'll see that as well. But these signs and miracles are recorded for the purpose of leading people to, to believe. Um, and these references also show the deity uh, of Jesus. So, with that, chapters 13 through 17, this segment kind of brings a change in the ministry of Jesus. He then starts to kind of focus in on his core group, and that is the apostles. And so, a lot of his teachings on that are mentioned um, in uh, John chapter 13. Through 17. Um, in chapters 18 through 20, um, we see that you know those key words continue to be the same, but you'll see the word witness, I think, a lot of, like in true and truth. Um, and then you just kind of see this progression of events that lead up to the death and then the resurrection 
and then some of the events that follow the resurrection. All right, so some things to kind of think about as you kind of go through. Um, we know why it was written. The question is, why would we study it? And, you know, you may have your own reason, well, because that's just what we're studying on Wednesday night. Or, you know, you may say that I haven't had a chance to really kind of maybe read John, but not really kind of take the time to kind of let it marinate in and let it really kind of soak in and see exactly what's being stated to it. So, you know, just kind of be thinking about why do I want to study this? Um, also, you know, do you know how to take another person through the scriptures and show them how to believe in you, that Jesus is the Christ? Well, here's your book. Mm -hmm. So it'd be well worth the study if you're wanting to lead someone on how to believe or what they should believe. Um, all right. Any questions or comments so far? All right, so let's go ahead and get right into John chapter 1. I don't know if everyone's had the opportunity to read um, the, the whole book or not. Hopefully you've kind of at least read the first one. And the very first, at the very beginning, you're going to see that there are a lot of similarities that John refers to in the Old Testament and just all of a sudden just kind of coming out and saying, Jesus is the one. So he just kind of lays it out there. And we read in John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning. Does that sound familiar? And where does it sound familiar from? Genesis. From Genesis. It sounds very familiar to Genesis. And what does Genesis 1-1 say? In the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now that's how, at, you know, in Genesis, that's how God chooses to introduce Himself to mankind, who are, if you're going to pick up the Bible and you say, I'm going to start at page one, God introduces himself this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So, we see that John kind of starts the same way. Now, the other Gospels, where do they kind of start? Yeah, usually the birth of Christ, a lineage, you know, something like that. But we're getting right into, in the beginning, well, what beginning? You know, so we know one Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's talk about this beginning just a little bit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, we're already kind of getting into something pretty deep here. Because if we want to understand John, we have to understand that he is trying to show the deity of Christ, and he points to it right here, all the way from the very beginning. In other words, think in your mind as far back as you can go. Put your peg there, and that's where Christ kind of comes out to meet you. And that is, in the beginning, wherever your infinite mind can take you, the Word was there. And the Word was God. And it was with God. So, really what he's saying here is all the stuff that you've studied in the previous time that you've studied anything about God, where do you get it from? How do you know what you know? How do you know that you need to be baptized? From the Word. From the Word. Mm -hmm. How do you know anything about the Holy Spirit? From the Word. Mm -hmm. We just got through studying some of the um, heroes of faith over in Hebrews. And if we just sit here and just let Stephen just tell us that's just the way it is, or what do we do? We went to the Word. We went to the Word. And then, you know, we're studying now Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians. you got to get in there. Well, guess what? Christ was manifested that way. And just as God spoke things into existence, here this man comes and he is the manifestation of what God spoke about in the Old Testament. He is everything that the Old Testament is about. Whenever we talk about, even from the very beginning, whenever man fell, and we talk about you know, how God was going to rectify that situation, what did he tell the serpent? Well, you're going to crawl on your belly, but what? 
you're gonna, yeah, your head's gonna get crushed by the Son of Man. And so that is exactly what we're talking about here. And whenever Abraham had the promise, what were the three promises given to Abraham? Land, nation, sea. Land, nation, sea. That's what we're talking about. And before even we started speaking in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, Christ was already there so we can see exactly where John is starting to take us. All right. He was in the beginning with God. So he makes that statement again. He is in the beginning with God. And then we see all things came into being by him. Now, what does that say about his role in all of this? I would say first. He's first. He's eminent in all that. He's preeminent in all that. He was, he was part of the creating process. I guess part that of the creating works process, yeah. one, one when they look at it. Well, it certainly you know, seems that way. You know, you, you go back to Genesis and you realize that the word Elohim is a plural word for God, which lets us know that, and this makes it clear that Jesus was there when that was happening. Correct. If you will, turn part to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. First Corinthians chapter eight and verse six. JD, do you mind reading that for us? Sure. Eight six, right? First mm -hmm. Corinthians eight and verse six. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Alright, and so in the NASB reads it a little bit differently than you've got the New King James. King James, yeah. Yeah, so it reads a little bit differently, and I want you to listen to the words that the NASB uses, and that is, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. So there seems to be a double role here that we have in each one of those relationships that we have for the Father. We were created for Him, and in Christ we were created through Him. And we see this also whenever you turn to Ephesians chapter 8, I'm sorry, Ephesians, <laughs> okay. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, because we, we know what Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says. And that is that we are only saved by grace, right? <laughs> Reading in context of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that's not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It is not a result of works so that no one may boast. Now, as we kind of look at that, I want you to note a couple of things, and that is, that these, uh, this idea of works and, and grace and how they work together. So it is not, it is by grace that you have been saved, and that is through faith. You have to have the faith in order to even receive the grace that's been given to you. And we're talking about a working faith, and we're talking about a faith that tells you you've got to do something. But... It is not a result of works that no one may boast. Now read verse 10, and as we kind of look at that word works, it's not of any kind of works. Well, that's not really all it says. In verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So it's not works of yourselves. It's not the works that you came up with. It's the good works that are through Christ which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So you can climb the highest mountain to try to get a spiritual sense of who God is. That is not how you are saved. <coughs> that is a work of yourself. And those are not there. And God does not make any kind of 
of uh, work that we can boast in. These things were prepared beforehand so that those who love him would walk in them. And we'll see that more and more in John. Is our responsibility whenever it comes to what true belief is. Because belief is much more than just a mental ascension. And John clearly shows that. Specifically in John chapter 5. But we're not there yet. <laughs> so I want to kind of point that out in the fact that we were created for the Father through Jesus Christ. And we see that in John chapter 1 and verse uh, 1 and 2 kind of playing out. He was beginning with God. All things, at verse 3, came into being through Him. And apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Now some have said, well, are we talking about the creation of the world? Or are we talking about the creation of the kingdom? What are we talking about? I just know what it says. And so I don't really want to kind of debate, you know, I just know that all things just means all to me. I mean, I, you know, don't really want to take issue with anybody else, but that's really what it says. In verse 4, I think it does kind of clue us in more about what he's talking about. In him, life was life, and the life was the life of men. So he even describes who that, um, what, what he's talking about there. Um, if you will, back to my, to my notes here. Um, Whenever we start talking about, we're going to see this quite a bit also. If you just turn to John chapter 5 and verse 26, you don't have to turn there, but um, I'll tell you this. He talks again about life. For as the Father has life in Himself, so He has granted the Son also to have life in Himself. We also see uh, this idea of life uh, being mentioned in uh, John chapter 11 verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, he still shall live. And so we see um, that what we're talking about is eternal life. And that's what he's really kind of making sure that we understand. Um, and that this light kind of came to, he was a light of men. He came to us to bring us uh, this life. All right, any questions? All right, moving on down. Let's move into um, verse 5. And that is, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So, again, we have some symbology kind of going on here. And that is, this word becomes flesh. And this flesh is light. And he's in darkness. But the darkness did not comprehend it. So, we all kind of understand exactly what's being spoken to us at this point, And that is, the darkness is of the world. And he did not comprehend it. Um, and there are a lot of side notes uh, to this uh, in that. But I want you to turn very quickly to John chapter 3 and verse 19. And again, as we kind of move through this, I'll continue to go back to John because I want John to tell us what John means. In John chapter 3, verse 19, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So he even gives a reason as to why people did not want the light. Because their, their, their works were evil. And they liked them. And it's hard to give up. And that is where we find ourselves a lot of times as well. And again, as we move through this, continue to say, where can I place myself in this? And you know, have a little bit of self-reflection and understand that this was not written for somebody else. It's written for you and for me. For everyone, in verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. None of us like that. We don't like our sins to be cast out in front of us. We don't like all of our secrets to be known. But the fact is this, whenever God's word comes into play, 
Your work, your works are then known. And that's part of being the light that Jesus had, and that was his job to expose those things. Alright, anything so far? Right, back to John chapter 1. Go ahead, John. Mike, I think you could also say that light is something that clarifies things because it's it's truth. And it brings truth to bear. Or that darkness which you know we're in when we're an unrepentant sinner, that's confusion, that's that's ignorance, and that's what we find in the world, the darkness of, of, of mankind and of sin and of, of evil. But you know, basically it's confusion and and, and not and the unknown, so to speak, but that light is something that clarifies and simplifies and reveals. So it makes things easier for us. Yeah, and you would think that we would that we would want that. Yeah. That we don't want to stumble around. But that's certainly not the paint the picture that's being painted for us, specifically in John, you know, whenever Jesus makes that statement. And it used to, it used to be said in hard times, people were looking for answers. Well, this is the answer that they would find normally in hard times. They would find the answers to life's problems in the Bible and the gospel. And that's the light that clarifies and answers the question that we have about life. Correct. Go ahead, Steve. The, the majority of people do want to stay in the darkness. And John 3.21, it talks about there are others, though, who do come to the light that their deeds may be clearly seen. So there are some that we want to know. We want to see where we're failing. As your prayer was at the beginning, you know, we, we need to be self-reflective and self-corrective. Those are few and far between. Yeah. And, you know, and a lot of times, you know, we even find ourselves, we know we're wrong, but we stay wrong. And, you know, that's, you know, where we have to understand that our responsibility is whenever the light kind of comes into our darkness, that it's time to start following the light. And um, whenever he makes a statement of this, um, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Um, whenever we're talking about that, what we are talking about are people who actually reject it. Um, and as you pointed out, there were people who were looking forward to it. Abraham looked forward to it. You know, and we'll read that later on. Um, but, you know, there were people who continued to look forward to this light coming to the world and to be able to bring about a way that God could show us through all of this darkness and all this confusion and chaos and everything else that happens around us, we have somewhere that we can look and find a true measure of where we are and where we need to be. And um, But we have to have the wherewithal to follow through the process that God has given us in order to make those corrections. Anything else? Just a minor thing when it comes to light and dark. It doesn't take much light to illuminate the dark. Yeah. Um, I think it was Ralph Stewart who told me that they were on a camping trip once and they lost their lights. All their lights went out. They got lost and they thought, they finally saw a light, and they were like, great, the search party's finally found us. Mm -hmm. They get up to it, no, it was, I think it was his son's, it was their watch light that they could see from however far away that they, that they could find. That's dark, dark. That was dark, 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 when you can see the flesh. Well, and think about this also, it's been stated before, that you can take all the darkness you want to, it cannot extinguish even so much as a match. Mm -hmm. So, you know, because it, it doesn't do anything except scatter. That's all it does whenever light comes into it. And that's the same thing with what we see here, is the darkness is now starting to scatter, and we're going to see that very quickly in here, um, in, in John chapter 1. I mean, challenges start just right off. So. All right, let's move on. In verse uh, 6, there came a man from God, and his name was John. Not the same John that's right in the book. This is John the Baptist that we're talking about. He makes it very clear in the fact that he says, he came as a witness to testify about what? The light. Came to testify about the light. So again, he would fall under that verse 21 that we were talking about. You know, he's looking forward to that light. But he came to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. So what is the hope that God has, that the light has, <clears throat> that the light has, and that now we see that John the witness has. 
all might believe. That all might believe. That all might believe. That's why this thing's been written. That's why John did his testimony. That's why the light came into, uh, you know, the word manifests itself into the light. Um, and so that is the true desire that God has for every one of us. Um, and we see uh, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe. Um, in um, Anybody know where that is prophesied? Turn to Malachi. Yeah. Chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. And verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. So here's this messenger kind of coming out. And uh, there are other uh, passages that we could look at that uh, talk about this. Uh, in Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Uh, continuing on, uh, in Matthew chapter 17, verses 11 through 13, And he answered and said, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. And so we see that this messenger was the herald of these things to come, that all things are now happening. The light's come into the world. And he does testify about that light as well. Um, Luke chapter 1, verse 17, if you want to go back to there. Um, and he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for, a Lord, for the Lord um, a people prepared. Um, and then we can also look at uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 14, and then Matthew chapter... Uh, 17, 10 through 13, which we just read. So um, we see that this was also planned out, that John um, was planned out. It's not that he just kind of came and had this feeling or anything like that. All of this is part of it, part of that line kind of coming into the world and the Word being manifested in Christ Jesus. Anything on John? Because we have like a little bit more to read. Go ahead. He points out that John the Baptist, who a lot of people talk very highly of, John's pointing out, well, John the Baptist, Christ was grand, was, was, was more, was, you know, what John was, was pointing towards. I think he's counteracting the argument here that you know, some who held up John to be the Messiah or who held, you know, the baptism of John was was the way to go that Jesus wasn't really really deity, but you know, he's saying, no, you know, John the Baptist declared the, the might and the and the deity of Christ himself. You know, it has always surprised me, maybe not surprised, I, you know, I try to see myself in this, but it'd be very hard for me to look at John the Baptist. Where's his miracles? Where are his signs? And people thought that this was the Messiah. I mean, you know, and he said, no, 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 it's not me. I'm just the messenger of the one to come. And then clearly in John chapter 1, a little bit later on, he says, there he is. And people still attach themselves to John. So, you know, that's always been kind of mind-boggling to me because you have all these signs and all these wonders, so many that the world could not contain the book if we wrote them all down. But yet, we don't really see that of John. Well, he, he, he did baptize, and a lot of people saw a lie. You know, in the baptism of repentance. That's what he, that's what he was baptizing. And a lot of people uh, <clears throat> in the way woke up to life, human life. By John. John woke them up. I mean, now they're looking for the Christ. Right, but so many people thought that that was, he was it. Because he, because he was a good speaker? I don't know. It you know, all I'm saying is that, yeah. you know, he kind of seems like a strange guy to me, and you know, and that's okay, but we see he's the messenger. 
And even after that point, he still has to continue to point. It's not me, it's him. This is the light of the world. And he, so he, met, he must have been pretty raw, though, because the king ended up uh, cutting his head off. Yeah, he didn't, well, obviously he didn't mind telling people about their sin. Hey, amen. That's what I was trying to say. And, um, but what we see about John is that he is only the messenger. He is, I'm only preparing the way. That's all I'm doing. I'm just a witness of, of these things. And then in verse uh, 9, whenever he said, or I'm sorry, in verse uh, 7, we see he came as a witness. And then verse 8, he was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. And so it's very important. And I don't know why it's important that John, the writer John, puts that in there, other than people may still be thinking that John was the light. I don't know. Well, I think people were teaching that mm -hmm. at Ephesus, that that was a problem. As you pointed out, right. John wrote later on, after the other Gospels had been written, and there were different problems probably that are happening at this time. That was right, because you have people who were only acquainted with the baptism of John. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, that may be why it's in there, but he makes sure that everyone understands John was not the light. He only testified about the light. I was actually just about to say that because Paul's <coughs> running across disciples of John, what's got to be at least 20 some years later. Right. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you with the way that John writes that, you can put whoever you want to in there. He is not the light. So you're talking about someone that's great, like John the Baptist. He wasn't even the light. And so we know that who we're talking about here. All right. Um, in verse, uh, in verse 9, there was the true light. Now, to me, he uses that word true for a very specific reason, probably because people are coming in saying they're what? I'm the light. Mm -hmm. I give knowledge. I give whatever. But we're talking about the true light. And it says, there was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So, no matter who you are, no matter... How far removed you are from God, you still can be enlightened. And you are enlightened. You know where you stand with God. You know, we talk about all the you know, things that are going on in our own society today, and the immorality, and this nonsense about a man and a woman, and all this kind of nonsense that's kind of going on now. What is that? It is rebellion because you know what the right thing is and you know what the wrong thing is, and so it is rebellion. So you are, all of us fall into that category. We are all enlightened. We know that we are all know what sin is, what it's not. And we know now that we need to look to the light. As far as this, as far as his writing goes. All right. Um, there was the true light which came into the world and lightens every man. In verse ten, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. So even though he was part of this creation, and I think that's what we're talking about previous, um, even though he's part of this creation, they did not understand, they did not comprehend, did not know who he was. But we do know he was what? And again, I'm going to take you back to John chapter 1, verse 1. He was the Word. So what does that mean about mankind and the world and their relationship with the Word of God? We're carrying it around with us. Well, you carry it around with you, but we need do you really it. know it? Yeah, do you really know it? He even told the Pharisees, you don't know the Father. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, we have a responsibility to know why we believe what we do and to comprehend, to understand that only comes with practice and it does not come from, you know, God just saying, bula, bula, and then there you got everything. I don't know if God says that or not. But what we see is that it takes you getting into the Word in order to comprehend it. We're running out of time. So I'm going to end there, and I'm going to ask this question. 
Are you in verse 10? And that is, He is coming to the world, the world was made through Him, and the world did not know Him. How much time do we put in our studies of really getting to know Him? This Gospel that you've been given, the Gospel of John, was written for a very specific purpose. So that you may believe. Do not fall into John chapter 1 and verse 10 and say, I don't know who He is. And if you do know, if you, if you are there and you see yourself there, do you want to change that? Because you can change it. That's why Christ even came here. In all of our sin and all of our mess and all of our drama that we have going on in life, Christ still wants us. That's, that's the condition He wants us in so He can fix it. So we have to kind of keep that in, in, in mind. And then in verse 11, He came to His own, and those who were His own did not receive Him. But as many received Him, to them He gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but those who were born of God. And that's why He came here. That's why this... To me, this book is very personal because I have to be able to see myself and where I am in my darkness and where I am in relation to the light. And I hope that you do as well. Anybody have any closing thoughts? Yeah, that sound that what is a lamp onto my feet and a light onto my path. Very good. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The, the world didn't know him because they had a different expectation of the Messiah. Therefore, they were just completely ignorant of Him, the Gentile world being ignorant of Him. But the Jews had a different expectation. There's a lot of people today, and, and sometimes it infects Christians, they have one idea of the Messiah. And that's what they go looking for in the Scripture instead of looking into the Scripture to Correct. see who the Messiah is right. and accepting what's there. Him, His doctrine, His plan, that's, that's where we need to be. That's a very good point in the fact that, you know, our expectation may not be the reality. And we have to kind of get our heads wrapped around that, that what we expect um, our Messiah to be may not be the reality of it. And what we expect Jesus to be for us, I mean, what do we expect the Bible to be? I mean, it's the Word, in, you know, incarnate Word. So what, what do we expect the Bible to be for us? Some kind of talisman that we just kind of carry around with us as a good luck charm? I mean, where, where do we kind of go with this? And what do you expect as versus the, the actual reality to it? So yes, you're, you're exactly right. They didn't comprehend it because they were looking for the wrong thing. And then we see in verse... Um, verse 11 says exactly that. He came to his own, and that is the Jews. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. They were expecting something different. They wanted to place a crown on him and make him king and all that, and that's, that's not what, what, it is, what you think it is. And we see that all the way up in Acts chapter 1. The apostles still confused about, well, when's all these things going to happen? When are you going to, you know... So, um, but what we, what we see is that a very self-reflective person needs to find themselves where they are in relation to their life and <laughs> understand that John's about to reveal all that we need to know in order to believe that Jesus Christ is that light, that He is the Christ. All right, we'll go ahead and end there. Thank you for your attention.